Okay, I'm going to do a very, very quick review from the the very beginning to um, for uh, fall preparation, which which is preparation starts in fall. It's about varroa uh, feeding, cluster size, and the queen quality. And we're going to skip to that. So the key thing is, is is cluster size in November of healthy bees. And that's because a, a, a queen is, what she can do as far as which brood colony can, can rear is based upon how big a cluster uh, the bees can cover. So uh, uh, one good queen can fill a deep lang straw with brood in three days. So if you only have a four frame cluster and she can fill two frames full of brood and then they, they stop expanding, that queen for 15 days out of the 21 days is not able to uh, increase the, the, the brood. She just sits there, has to, has to wait. So you want a large enough cluster size. And the cluster has to be free of deforming virus and free of, of varroa. So you need to treat in the late summer to have a, a healthy cluster. But how the, the change of the, the bees that emerge um, now, this is for Canada. You guys don't have as, as cool a, a winter here. But the bees emerge while there's brood rearing going on. So this is your starting your emergence date up here. They die very quickly, each cohort of bees. So up in Canada, the, all the July and August cohorts die very, very quickly. And then once the colony ceases brood rearing, there's not young brood in the colony when a bee emerges. They go into this diotinus physiology for a very long time until they initiate brood rearing and then they, they die very quickly. This is your spring turnover right here. <clears throat> and this, this also happens here in California uh, in dry areas in the middle of summer where if they shut down brood rearing, they'll go into the same diatinus state. So anytime a colony has, mm -hmm. is not rearing due to lack of food, the bees shift to this diatinus physiology to wait out until there's pollen coming back in again. So what we do is, uh, up here, we don't have much of a fall pollen flow. So starting September 1st, we start feeding uh, two, three pounds of pollen sub every 10 days or so to our colonies to build up that cluster size. Because we like to go into winter with about a 10 frame uh, cluster size. And we'll also, if necessary, stimulate them with some light syrup. The, the light syrup adds moisture uh, inside the hive and simulates a natural nectar flow. So they utilize that protein to think on a nectar and, and pollen flow. I mean, we'll also make sure that we uh, have enough uh, of uh, stores of honey above the cluster. Ideally, we like to have in our environment down to in the bottom box and then honey above it. So when they brood up and uh, start brooding up in early January, they just eat their way right up that honey because we don't have a uh, generally a nectar flow yet, but we want that colony to uh, utilize that energy to warm up a brood nest. And as soon as uh, we get to the lowest amount of, of brood in the winter, uh, sometime during December for us usually, we'll give every colony an oxalic acid um, to every single seam of bees, five milliliters of oxalic acid. And that cleans the colonies up, gets them ready for uh, a winter. Something else we hear about is all these winter, winter losses. Well, the, the axiom used to be, take your winter losses in the fall. Don't waste your time trying to overwinter weak or sickly colonies. So um, the, the better beekeepers who have very low winter mortality rates typically are those that take their winter losses in the fall and they only try to winter the, the good, strong, healthy colonies. And then the last piece of advice is there's all kinds of companies wanting to sell you bee health products and all kinds of magic. And uh, I, I uh, have not yet found anything that um, is of benefit other than just decent uh, pollen or pollen sub and sugar syrup. Okay, and then on the buildup, uh, it typically it starts with the first tree pollens or with pollen sub starting. So we, we start uh, usually the first week of January and then shortly after that, the alders start blooming where we're at. So I, I'm not sure what happens down with you guys. And then. You need to have, allow that cluster to be able to um, allow the queen to lay at her full capacity. Now the queen, a young queen, will generally outlay a queen in her second year. So if you really want to build up big, then you want to 
uh, replace your queen uh, during the season in the fall, so she have a, a, a young, very vigorous queen. Um, and that's pretty much it. your next thing. Then is just this avoidance of the swarm impulse. If you build your colony too big too early, they're all going to want to hit the trees um, uh, sometime in um, late February or early early March. So balancing act of trying to build the colonies up. The larger the colony, the better they can put on a honey crop, but you also they want to swarm in the springtime. Okay, I'm going to stop. Any questions on uh, fall preparation or spring buildup? You guys all good on that? Well, it's amazing that this group is not uh, talkative. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. I'll, I'll go right on to the um, well, hang on, let me get to my uh, all right. So Randy, what are you doing with the small colonies? Are you uh, are you combining them or? Yeah, what we do is um, we don't we don't combine small weak colonies with strong colonies because there's a reason that they um that's her last name that they're small no, no. Uh, what, what do you do with um the weaker colonies that's the, that's the question um we we can make combine two three four of them all together um the last thing we want to do is combine a weak colony with a strong colony because there's probably a reason why the weak we colony, and we don't want to give that reason <laughs> to the strong colony. And what we find is many times a weak colony, if they just have more bees to make a larger cluster, they deal with whatever is causing them the problem and they, they rebound. So um, combining a bunch of weak colonies together, that's, that's very common. We'll, we'll stack them three boxes high and the clusters will all combine and then oftentimes you get a, um, a recovery of that. Do you pinch any queens when you do that recombining? Re um, well, if that's what turns you on, we don't bother with uh, with it. <laughs> let the let the bees work it out. We oh, we hey, we really trust the bees. The bees know a whole lot more about beekeeping than than <laughs> we do. Okay, so no, we uh, we we rarely pinch a queen. We combine colonies willy nilly, um, and we um, we rarely bother to look look to see on on the queen. Okay. So what I'm going to show you uh, now is um, that's what we can do. One of my uh, field trial yeah. from the summer. Reducing first. Okay, somebody still un is unmuted there. Is it? Did somebody decide to start recording this? Yes. That's a you guys. Okay. So this summer, you guys got some smoke down there. It was pretty crazy up here too. This I took this in the afternoon, about three o'clock in the afternoon, when all of, I'm working some bees at another out yard. And suddenly this dark cloud just makes everything dark. And I turn around and I see the sun. It was just a, it didn't look like this. It was a little red ball. And a minute later, there was no sun whatsoever. We had to turn our headlights on at three in the afternoon, drive out, out of the yard. It just, it just like, a, it was like a solar eclipse. It was just amazing, the smoke moving over. And when finally, I, I, and I didn't know if the fire over the hill or, or distant. I drove up a little bit in elevation and was able to see the smoke up above. Um, uh, pretty spectacular up, up there, but it's been uh, pretty crazy. And again, I hear that you guys had plenty of smoke. Mm -hmm. I've yeah. also got a yeah. new uh, field assistant in uh, training, a t technician. I'm, I'm about to and uh, this is Eric's uh, son, my moment. grandson. OK, somebody's not muted. Yeah, I'm trying to find an, anyone who's not muted. Um, Peter Bauer is not muted. OK, yeah, I'm going to go through and mute everyone. So. No, no offense. I'm going to be hitting them. There you go. Sorry. Okay, so this is um, grandson, uh, writer, and he was free from school one day, and uh, this is the uh, probiotic trial. So I, I'm, I'm blinded to treatment. We got red, red, green, and blue that we're we're feeding, and uh, what we have to uh, on the colony since they're randomly assigned to treatments. I need a technician with make sure that every colony gets the proper treatment. And uh, so Ryder stepped right up for that. OK, varroa management. Um, summer varroa management. You, it, I'm going to go over some varroa population dynamics, monitoring methods, and, and the seasonally appropriate uh, treatments. 
and uh, maybe some of the side effects here. So whenever a colony is rearing brood, so this is my, my, my model here, free download, Randy's row model, and it shows the amount of sealed brood, not the open brood in the colony. You actually, if you include the open brood, the amount of total brood often in the springtime exceeds the population of adult bees in the hive. They can be two to three times the, the population of adult bees in the form of a brood uh, during this, this period of time right now. <clears throat> and then when, uh, whenever colonies rearing brood, it's also uh, mites are able to reproduce. Then the thing to keep in mind is that when you, if you're using uh, alcohol wash or detergent uh, counts or sugar shake, they will underestimate the amount of mites in the brood early in the season um, because so many of mites are in the brood relative to the adult bee population. And then they will overestimate the mite uh, um, in the colony, but it but show the actual mite infestation rate of the adult bees later on. So this can be misleading early in the season because the, the, this is when the mites get ahead of, ahead of you early in the season, but you don't know. <clears throat> the other thing to understand is when you're doing these adult bee assessments as opposed to sticky board counts, they directly correlate with the virus pre prevalence in the hive. So the red line here is your mites per 100 bees. And the blue line is your prevalence of highly infected workers by deforming virus or by the paralytic viruses right here. You can see they just track just perfectly right here. So you want to keep your mite count down, keep your virus uh, count down. <clears throat> then one of the misconceptions is that, is that the bees are outrunning the mites early in the springtime because you don't seem, see so many mites. But when I, I plot out the actual uh, biweekly uh, change in population of either the mites, which is in the red graph, or in the of the honeybees, which is in the orange graph. This is based on this is this this blue line right here. So if it's uh, moving up uh, above the blue line, that means during that time period the population is increasing. So it's increasing by 20% um, right here. If it's down below, that means the population is decreasing. And this is the, um, the rate by this is, that's your rate of increase or decrease. And what you see is Varroa comes charging out of the gate early in the springtime and it just leaves the bees behind. The Varroa, varroa rate of increase is always faster than the, than the bee rate of increase throughout the entire season. And this is the key thing to look at very high rate, which occurs in most areas of the country at this time of the year. In California, we shift much earlier. So, so if you're an almond planter or you guys have a, a flow in December or in, uh, in February, um, your grow rate is peaking in February right now. And this sets the stage for the whole rest of the season, this very high peak of Varroa increase early in the season. This is really a key for Varroa management is to knock this down with early mite control in, in March or, or April. And we find that key to success in our operation. Uh, just because you have low alcohol um, at this time of year does not mean that you should not be getting furrow way down. You wanna have mite counts of zero um, th that time of year. <clears throat> Reason is, is that the absolute increase in mites, not percentage, but the actual number of increase is a function of the uh, starting mites for any time period. It's an exponential uh, progression. So this is not, this is the, the number of extra mites in a hive for every 15 days uh, right here. Not, and so for your total mites in the hive, you would stack these one on top of those. So each one before would stack on top of the next one. It's a very steep curve up. The point is, is that early in the season, you're only getting maybe 200 more mites every 15 days in the hive added to the pot. But because you have a bigger starting number be between this and this, by, by later in the season, you're getting over a thousand mites added every two weeks. Now, if you reduce the population of mites early, watch what happens. I put in a 80% mite reduction in May. Look what it does to the, the absolute mite base for the rest of the season. It just knocks the snot out of it. Grow just grows very slowly. So my take home message to you is control, get your, get off to a good start and get your mites way down in that March through, through April uh, time period. 
Now, if you fail at that, or if you have picking up mites somehow, then you may have to deal with mite buildup during the flow. Now, your flow is a bit earlier than most people's. So most people, uh, the nectar flow is, is, is May, May through um, July or, or in the July, something like that. I'm a, my RS ends a little bit earlier. But that bit of time is one that's often very hard to control mites because you got honey supers on. And if you don't control mites during that period of time and the mite comes up, well, you can do a really good mite knockdown in September, but it's too late. You've already got this, this virus epidemic going on inside the hive and your colonies crash. So you may need to do a treatment right during, the, during June or July while you have honey supers on the hive. The problem is there's restrictions for each kind of treatment. Um, currently, oxalic acid is not even legal in California yet at, in any form. Uh, and <laughs> even if it were, it's only registered for early spring and late fall when there's no brood in the colony. Now we're working to try to, to change that. Amitraz, um, you've got to stop the treatment two weeks before you put honey supers on. It takes eight weeks for a full amitraz of efficacy. So you need to in 10 weeks before the honey flow for it to work. Um, thymol, you don't really want to use thymol early in the season because it suppresses brood rearing and knocks the, the, the buildup back. So thymol is better for a late season treatment. What it leaves while you have honey supers on is formic acid and the hop guard, the hops beta acids. <clears throat> now, uh, just as an aside, uh, some of you may have read the article in Forbes magazine by uh, about Raina Jane, a high school uh, back in New York, who has patented this device to put in, in the front of a hive and um, has passages impregnated with thymol for the um, with you to see if that will reduce the, uh, the mite population in the hive. So Raina contacted me and asked me if I would be willing to collect data for her and test the efficacy of it. So here's one of her... Uh, I got uh, 10, 10 highs uh, in the trial right now, testing these for her. They, the bees do not like entering the time um, holes initially, but they, they wind up doing it when they're forced to. And I was, I've been taking daily uh, sticky board counts of mite drop on these hives um, to collect data. And now I'm, I'm uh, shifting over to alcohol wash counts. <clears throat> Another uh, way of, um, of controlling mites in, uh, during the summer is uh, by thermal treatment. And this is an article from, um, from Europe, 2016. And they point out that if you can raise the temperature of the brood up to above 104 degrees Fahrenheit, and typically the, the target temperature is 106 degrees, for two and a half hours, mortality of the mites in the sealed brood is virtually absolute. Well, that's a really strong statement. Vir Virtually absolute. That's pretty pretty strong for a kill. So there, and I, I checked on the uh, there's some thermal treatment devices being sold in the United States, and um, one of these guys, Mike Immer, had some really good data showing the alcohol wash counts dropping down to to zero after um, the the uh, heat treatment. So I was excited about this, and I got one of the devices to uh, to test, <coughs> and I have. Um, I blocked out the, the name of the device right here because that was not what I was in. I was interested in what would happen. And you can see it, there's a plate that warms up the inside of the hive. You put a, a styrofoam cover over it and, uh, and the bees beard out while, while you're um, uh, doing this uh, uh, treatment. But there's no noticeable mortality of the adult bees. And I put additional into the... Uh, into the hive, um, uh, just into the airspace uh, near the top of the hive, and then also um, uh, buried underneath the sealed brood, so I can make sure the temperature actually did penetrate clear to the midrib of the of the combs and got got that brood up to that uh, uh, temperature. And I confirmed, yes, that the, the sealed brood does heat up to 106 degrees, and is held for that period of time. And then I did. Well known to, I went back after 24 and 48 hours and dissected out brood in the colony to see whether or not the mites were still alive or not. And you can see very easily these two mites were upside down. They're, they died right here. Whereas the live mites, they, they would uh, scurry around very actively. They clearly were not harmed by the, um, by the treatment. 
And uh, I dissected out both drone brood and uh, worker brood. <clears throat> right here, this is uh, pupae, uh, pro pupae I pulled out. And I, all, all these mites were <laughs> very much alive and vigorous and actively walking around. Um, so there's plenty of live mites left. Surprisingly, uh, when I, uh, on my first hive, uh, when I did 24 hour treatment, there was a, a line of drone brood right along the bottom bar of the um, of an uh, of a frame in the upper uh, brood chamber, just above the airspace. And uh, the out of the drone brood, there was one, only two live and 16 dead. And I was pretty excited about the mite kill. And then I went and looked at the worker brood right next to it, and I had 22 live and only two dead, just the opposite. This was the only good kill. I found in all of my dissections. Here's 34 live and three dead. Couldn't find any. <coughs> 12 alive, four dead, 40 alive, eight dead in the drone brood, and nine alive and one dead in the worker brood. So obviously, um, high mite survivorship. Now, there's a possibility maybe those mites were sterilized. Um, that's one of the things that the manufacturer uh, claims. So this is alcohol washes, uh, posts for the four different hives, uh, starting mite counts here, 24 hour mite counts here. So they did drop after uh, by 24 hours. And by day, and so you, now you had 12 days worth of sealed brood in the hive. So I waited till day 15 until all the sealed brood emerged uh, to see what would happen. And sure enough, the mite counts uh, did go down. Now, if those any remaining mites were sterilized, you would not expect to see the mite counts go back up. But as you can see, the mite counts, the mites did rebound vigorously after the treatment. So by 31 days, you were of your starting count. So was not too impressed by the thermal treatment. I'm certainly interested. If anybody has had good experience, please let me know um, about that. The other thing I was listening, uh, University of uh, Washington State University had a um, presentation last week and um, Allie McAfee was on and she was talking about showing this, the safe zone for shipping queen bees. And when you get over 101 degrees Fahrenheit for over, if you warm queen bees up over that temperature, their sperm viability, st sperm stored in the spermatheca declines very, very rapidly. So you don't want to hold a queen at uh, above 101 degrees for over an hour. Well, we're doing it in these thermally treated hives. They're two and a half hours, more than two and a half hours over that temperature. So I, I watched her presentation in the morning. I said, oh my gosh, we're, when we take a lunch break, I'm going to run outside and <laughs> check for viability, queen viability or survivorship in those um, four colonies. And uh, I, did, I did that and then reported back that when I checked back from four of them, two of them, the queens had failed in those colonies. So um, that's very small end to come up with any conclusions, but something that I was curious about because I'm hearing from the other beekeepers, they didn't have a problem with queen, uh, queen failure. So um, I'm getting con a conflicting, <laughs> I got my data on one side and reports from other beekeepers on the other. A anybody in your group, um, if anybody in your group has used thermal treatment afterwards, why don't you go ahead and contact to hear what your results were. The other one is oxalic acid vaporization, very common in, in much of the country. I just spoke to Ohio beekeepers uh, three hours ago, and uh, they a lot of them use the oxalic acid vaporization. It's not legal to use during the, uh, the when there's honey on the, on the hive, and they use quite a bit during the summer. And when I tested it out with vaporization is roughly every 10 days over a long period of time. It took, it took me about six, seven vaporizations to get the mite levels down to the level approaching a, a low level here. It took uh, fully nine vaporizations down to where I like to see them. So I'm not very impressed with oxalic acid vaporization as a mite control treatment when there's brood in the hive. So let's go back to the ones that are approved when there are, are honey supers on. These are a hop guard and formic pro. And both of these have a new, uh, this year, a new treatment. Um, the uh, hop guard says it's an improved and the formic pro um, has a longer shelf life. And I'll tell you right now, the new packaging is much more applicator friendly, much easier to open up, much uh, less blast of formic acid when you open it. So I'm very happy with that. And then I just found out today 
their auction to register an extended release oxalic acid treatment also. Just found that out minutes ago, actually. Um, <clears throat> and I, I ran a test comparing the, uh, the uh, Formic Pro to the um, Mitoa quick strips, my quick strips in red and Formic Pro in here. This is the weight um, uh, loss per day of them. And they're identical all the way down. But I, I need to get some more data. Apparently, the Formic Pro in the first couple of hours, uh, which doesn't show here, this is just at the 24 hour count, um, has a little bit less blast at the beginning. So maybe a little gentler yeah, on the colony. Now, there also are limitations. The hop guard says its efficacy increases when there is less brood present. That's kind of like a double negative and a way of saying that the efficacy decreases when there's brood present. So I did this trial during the summer when there was brood present. Formic Pro says recommended temperature of application 50 to 85. Now, that's not a problem for you guys down in the Bay Area necessarily, but up in the foothills, uh, we're above 85 for much of the summer up here. And then the real reason I wanted to run this uh, trial was to test out this extended salic acid. And uh, I had been using shop towels a couple of previous years. So this year I tried using these uh, Swedish cellulose sponges. Um, I made up with um, 25 grams each in each uh, sponge a strip of oxalic acid and 25 grams of glycerin. <clears throat> we want quite a bit of the Swedish sponges. I, I, I'll tell you right now, we're not going to be using these again. There were, uh, we were not particularly happy with them. Now, I want to be very clear. Anything I say is experimental results only. I am not advocating you guys do this because uh, actually I'm the only beekeeper in all of California who can legally apply oxalic acid to a beehive in any form. Um, I have a pesticide research authorization to do that. So I'm only showing this stuff as research results since I am funded by beekeeper donations and some of you guys have donated towards this research. And as stakeholders, you deserve to see the results. So I set up this trial with 263 hives in seven different yards at seven at different elevations. Uh, June 23rd through 6 August were the treatments, 44 days, uh, uh, ah, 42 days duration. I'm going to change that. Uh, high temp temps were um, from the 80s to the high 90s with low relative humidity. And then since I was interested in seeing the effect of the former treatment on the um, uh, on the queens, I ran the whole second year queens. They'd come back from almonds. I split the colonies and started them again as nukes with the older queens. But we had a really lousy spring because of the rain. And they'd only grown to eight to 10 frame strength by the time the, the trial started. And many of them had, had only recently received a second brood chamber, some of which only had predation in them. So these are relatively weak colonies. So these treatments were probably fairly intense on these colonies. And then I wanted to start with a number of high mite levels so I could get good statistical significance. If you start with a mite count of, of two in, in a hive, well, one mite represents 50% of the mite count. So if, you, if your next mite count is, is three, you've gone up by, by 50% over that beginning. Instead, what I'm looking for is a mite count of 30 to start, and I want to see that, that take that down to a mite count of one. Then I know that really was not just um, um, random chance. The treatments I tested were oxalic glycerin. Oh, what am I doing? Escape. Uh oh, I hit a wrong button. And I've got, I don't know what I did. I've got a uh, pencil that looks really scary, like it's going to do something bad. Anybody know what that is? The, that Looks like your cursor. A cursor. Your, your cursor what? got changed. My cursor <laughs> got, got a, changed. It got a facelift. If you're using PowerPoint, that pencil would actually be There I go. No, I got it. I'm back. I figured it out. It's a miracle. <laughs> okay, oxalic glycerin <laughs> on a uh, one strip sponge, about three by eight inches is the, the size, containing 25 grams of oxalic acid. Let me tell you right now, forget what it contained. We're going to cover that later. It was one, one sponge strip. The second one was two sponge strips. Then I, try, I threw some in also to the shop towels just to compare the two half shop towels. 
uh, hop guard, one strip for five frames of ease. Formic Pro, one strip repeated at 10 days or Formic Pro, uh, two strips at once. And then I needed some controls, so I did um, untreated controls, but I didn't want them to start with too high a mite level because I didn't want them to crash during the middle of the trial. So um, uh, colonies that had a minimum mite count of 10 or a maximum of 20 were all that I used for the low mite controls, where many of these had started with much higher mite counts. And you'll see all this. So here's uh, two shop tiles going in, same as last year. The comparative, this I did not treat all three in one high, but just to show that's a Formic Pro pad, that's a hard strip, and this is the uh, uh, one of the um, cellulose sponges. So you can see the relative sizes of these uh, treatments. And notice these are really goopy to apply, and we made a discovery at a restaurant. You can buy these little food uh, handling gloves thin and really easy to put on and off when you have sweaty hands and they're so cheap that you don't, I'm such a, a cheapskate um, penny pincher, to nitrile gloves, I will uh, rinse them off and turn them inside out and then blow them out and reuse them over and over again. I'm not tempted to do with these. So these are light duty protective gloves. We really like these a lot for handling these, these different uh, treatments. Here's a typical test yard, um, bare fence here and uh, black, ending, uh, near ending of bloom here. We really were not expecting much more flow, honey uh, nectar flow after this, after this time. But then surprised that um, a bunch of plants bloomed and you can't see it here, but a uh, yellow star thistle uh, actually wound up producing some honey. And some of these colonies actually uh, put on uh, 40 or more pounds of uh, weight in honey. The results. So, of data. So this is what on my uh, spreadsheet right here. Hang on a second. I got too many things. Those of you who are watching, there's two windows that you have inside <laughs> on uh, doing Zoom. You have to keep moving around so you can see your slides. Um, so this is how my spreadsheets looked. I, I recorded whether the, there were bees in the upper box or not um, with the starting mic count. Some got midpoint mite count, uh, then a final mite count, and then also whether they uh, were queen right or queenless at the end of the trial, and then all the uh, treatments assigned here. So this is data just for 23. There were 263 hives, so it's a very large data set, and I teased that data for a long time to come up with uh, results. <clears throat> so the first thing is, is I want to get some midpoint counts, but I didn't want to sample all 263 hives again. The might washes are relatively tedious. Um, so I went into each yard and I pulled out a few representative hives in each treatment. Representative meaning they were fairly strong hives with moderate mite counts and had bees in the, both the upper and the lower boxes. So ones that I, that, that were no excuse for them. That just looks like good healthy hives. So here's the, now, I use the line graphs. I should be using step graphs. You should step from here, from here, up to there, up to there. It's hard to track a bunch of hives. So I'm using line graphs so you can visualize. But it doesn't mean that this was a straight progression of mites. I have no idea what happened between the data points. But it lets you see overall for every hive what happened. So in general, the control hives didn't have much increase the first half of the trial. And then they We're not seeing increased a graph. We're a still bit. seeing the spreadsheet. Hmm. Oh, it says my screen sharing is paused. Thank you. Oh, what happened here? Oh, I see. Okay, hang on. How about now? Now yeah, we got it. Good. Okay. So uh, <coughs> a line graph <coughs> doesn't mean anything. Lines just connect the dots is all. So um, uh, you can see the mite counts rose in the control group as we expected. For the um, the Formic uh, uh, Pro, the two treatment uh, dates right here, and obviously the mite counts would have dropped right here, but reduction um, uh, by midpoint and stayed stayed down. So that indicates um, what what the reason for the two treatments is days is after the mites have re 
emerged from the brood after the first treatment, this is supposed to get the, the mites that have come out. And by the lack of mite built afterwards, it indicates that it's pretty efficacious doing that. Formic Pro with the two strips knocks the mites down hard right away, way down here in a couple of outliers. But notice the mites start to climb again. So without that second knockback, you get a little bit of climb back up. OK, the um, hop guard <clears throat> looks like a pretty good mite knockdown on, on most of them, but not all of them. And then I was confused by the label. The label seemed to indicate they talked about repeated treatments, but it was only under the fall application is the way it read. So I didn't know whether it was permissible to use them during the um, uh, uh, summer application. I found out later that it was permissible and also later that I should have uh, done it afterwards because this climb right here uh, continued upward with only one treatment. Shop towels, as I've seen before, almost nothing the first few weeks and then you get a slow decrease in the mite levels. The 125 uh, uh, sponge, not too impressive. This, it drops down a bit and then fairly steady here. And the, but the two uh, sponges, much better look right here. So this gives us an idea of what we might expect overall. Okay, so now let's look at all the hives. <clears throat> I'm gonna show you uh, column graphs uh, right here. Each, uh, uh, each hive is represented by two columns, a blue column, which is your starting mite count, red column, which is your ending mite count. So in this hive, the, the count went way up over the course of the 42 uh, days. The letters indicate the yard. And so I grouped all of them, all the hives in this yard for this treatment together, all the hives in that yard, all the hives in that yard right there. <clears throat> so you can look for a yard effect. And then I calculated for all of them, the group median, so the median starting count and the median ending count. So medians mean half were above or half below. So you don't get skewed by the outliers. <clears throat> okay, so for the controls. Oh, and here's the interpretation of these graphs. If you see a lot of red, that means counts went up. If you see a lot of blue, that means counts went down. So in this one, you see a lot of reds. So you know counts went up. And overall, they went up by 58% uh, above the uh, starting count right here. So that, that was good because it's hard to see if your control group doesn't go up in counts. From a pro with the uh, uh, one strip repeated, very good overall uh, efficacy, the median reduction to only 17% of the uh, starting count in all the yards in this yard, the counts went up. Now, this is really weird because this was the, the, the Loma Rica yard, the L right here. With the one strip treatment, all the counts went up. Now, look at the next slide of the two strip treatment. So, the world, Formic Pro, would, when one yard would not work where the two, where the uh, Formic Pro one strip, where the two strips worked just great in that yard. I have no idea what something weird happened. This is why it's really important to repeat any kind of trial, replicate it in multiple yards. So you, if you have one, one aberration, so this is clearly an aberration in here that could, should be able to be discounted. But even that, despite all of these going up, group median took it down to 17% of the starting count. With the two strips, you know, it came <clears> down to 20% of the starting count. So uh, they're about the same. Now, the formic really killed the mites. Very easy to see uh, them dropping off. And as I've always seen with formic acid, afterwards, the brood comes back just beautifully after formic acid. A lot of these had really lousy brood patterns when I started, but the great afterwards. And the colonies after the formic generally recovered very, very quickly. <clears throat> and a number of them, so if you look at the date here, 2020, Fraser Foundation put on top of a single at the beginning of this trial. But by the end of the trial, they had drawn the foundation on all 10 frames and filled them fairly full of, of honey. So um, the recovery from the formic 
was very quick. So that quick knockdown got the mice down very quick and the bees responded to a uh, quick knock, mock, knockdown. But the question everybody's curious about is, is the queens. What happened about with all the queens, with all these older queens um, uh, with the former treatment in hot weather? And it was indeed hot. Here's the weather graph. This is the temperature. The and I've indicated the recommended maximum temperature with this little horizontal red line. And you can see the temperatures were going up. The, we took the mic counts back here. And I said, oh, God, we got to hold off. It's too hot. And then after a week, I said, no, we got to put the treatments in because we have our starting counts. So we went ahead and applied the treatments at, at, during the day when the temperatures got appreciably higher, like 10 degrees higher than the recommended temperature. For the second form of treatment, they were just barely at recommended temperature for the first day. And the bees responded appropriately. They bearded up. They did not like acid put on in a hot uh, day. Now, one of the things I've, I've learned, this is from other trials, where I've caged the queen beneath the formic uh, treatments, they actually, um, the, I don't know the formic acid is what actually kills the queens. Um, the queens all survive just fine directly, directly below the formic treatment. So I'm not sure whether it's the bees that, that kill the queens or what it is. So this is a <clears throat> unanswered subject the original research with formic acid uh, here in the United States by Amory and Noel years ago said that they added um, honeybee healthy lemongrass oil and spearmint oil. That reduced the amount of queen loss when they used formic acid, but I have not seen any follow-up work on that at all. That's a promising avenue of research. Okay, here's the results. Let me move my things around. <clears throat> here's the total hives across here for each of the treatments. At the end, um, if they were either queenless, did not have a laying queen, or they had died, I, I counted them right here. That's the percentage of the starting count that were either queenless or had died. The controls that they got no treatment, 5% um, of them were queenless at the end of the trial. Now, this was not surprising. These were second year queens approaching uh, going into August when the colonies naturally supersede and queens start to fail. <clears throat> but that, that's our baseline here, this around 5% number. Former Pro out of 28 hives treated, only one was queenless at the end of the trial. Now, that's not to say that they didn't have queens replaced. A number of them, I could tell, the queens had been replaced, but by the end of the trial, 20 days they, uh, after treatment, they were back with a fresh laying queen. So they, um, you, you can see just beautiful brood patterns of, of fresh eggs. Pro uh, with the two strip treatment, really intense and in, in that heat. Um, for six yards, only three of them were queenless at, in a trial. But at one yard, which um, we applied a midday during extreme heat, uh, five out of five were queenless at the end. They did not, did not leak. Hop guard, no problem with queen loss. And with the oxalic, again, right there in line with the baseline value. So this was a, a huge thing that even at extremely high temperatures, the two formic pro strips did really good uh, control without excess loss. Hop guard, I'm not gonna even show you the results. Uh, I, I should have repeated treatments and I'll, I'll, I'll try them next year and let you know. Um, Oxalic shop towels, uh, not too impressive. It was a short trial. Uh, I know that at, at 42 days, you don't normally you have super high efficacy. The one oxalic sponge, again, not even though, like, look at this one. Starting my count of close to 70 and drops down to zero. Another one here, starting my count of, of 50 dropping down to zero. But a lot of them did not go down that much. So instant. And then last, the two oxalic acid sponges. And if you look over over here, right here. And uh, Jim, I'll let you I'll let you answer this one. If I have a tall blue column right there and there's no red after it, what was the ending mite count there? I would say you had zero. Yeah. That would be a zero. So any of these blue columns, even these ones starting really high, 
My count was zero at the end of the trial. This is what I really like to see. I like, I like a lot of just straight blue columns with no red after them. So very impressive with the two sponges. Group median, only 10% of the starting count, the best of any of the treatments. And then when I, when I calculated efficacy by two different uh, methods, one, I added up all the total mite counts for the whole group at the starting and the total mite counts at the uh, ending and, um, and calculated efficacy uh, that way compared to the controls at zero. And the other, I took the median starting count and the median ending count and counted and calculated efficacy just to see if there's any difference. And you can see most of them, they're right in the same, uh, pretty much in the same, same range. And by far the winner, in both ways of calculating was the oxalic acid two sponges. So um, very much proof of concept compared to the two, um, well, the hop guard didn't really get a fair trial, but compared to the uh, formic acid, um, uh, hop guard really kicked, kicked butt. I was very happy with it. Now the question is, what were the effects on the brood? So I pulled out some typical brood frames on a, the double at the end of the trial, and you can take a look right here. You tell me if there's much adverse effects on, on the brood. So I mean, these went in with, with high mite counts and shipping patterns, and they came out looking very nice. Okay, that was the formal trial. Now, I also, we did some other experiments. We we're working with a couple of grad students uh, supplying bees from them at uh, high elevation wet meadows at 6,500 feet up in the Sierra. And um, uh, these are very different from the conditions down in the foothills. The first thing is the colonies really grew in strength because of, of the bloom up there. And they immediately start rearing drones and the, they just pack these colonies full of drones. So when there's drone rearing, rearing going on, mites reproduce at their highest rate. So this was mites to really increase their numbers at a very high rate. Um, most of the colonies did put on a honey crop, but the important thing was there are no other beehives that there's there's no other population of honeybees up at that elevation here because we already had grad students all already checking for pollinators and there were no reports of honeybees until we brought our hives in. That means there can be no mite drift from other colonies. You guys down there in the Bay Area have a little tiny problem with a whole bunch of treatment free beekeepers just drifting mice like crazy into your hives in case you haven't uh, noticed that, <laughs> that issue. So up here, we were just the opposite. There was no mite drift at all. So uh, this is the first yard. This is uh, after 63 days, we checked them. And the two strip, uh, and, uh, nice control, one strip, fair. But the other two yards, look at that. Look at the lack of red on that. So my sons brought down these two uh, uh, groups of hives together uh, one night. And the next day I said, okay, I can't wait. Let's go out there and, and mite wash them all and see what we got. <clears throat> and Eric was running the mite washer. I was taking the samples. As we were getting along there, I said, Eric, how are we looking here for, uh, for mite wash counts? He goes, dad, I've never seen so many zeros in a row. So this is at 77 days after treatment, we put in the two strips in in um, June at some uh, brought them back after 77 days. This is an example of a treatment that you apply when you would be putting your honey supers on, and seven days later when you pull the honey supers off, there's no mites in those hives. It just cleans them up. Is that cool or what? So this is this is very exciting right here to me. But again, no mite drift coming in from outside. Now, we also were running these other controlled And in these, we treated them with a quarter of a sponge, a little 12 and a half uh, gram uh, sponge, either hung over the top bars of the nuke when we started them, or laid over if they were in, in a double, laid across the top bar. So a very small amount. This is half the amount of the single strip that we saw in the other ones. And then when we check back later across there, we're seeing these very low mite levels. And we followed these colonies um, for quite a while. This is, this is going um, uh, September. 
with only that one little initial treatment in June, it kept mite levels down across the board in hundreds of colonies until the end of September. And then they started to climb a little bit in October. It's showing me is it doesn't take much formic acid applied early in the season to maintain low mite levels. Oxalic. Okay. Oxalic acid. Yeah, oxalic acid. Oh, oxalic, I'm sorry. Oxalic acid, yes. Okay. Oh, I was curious about these outliers where, where the mite counts went up. What in the heck is that? Huh. I just drew something here. <laughs> Figure out how to erase that. <laughs> okay, so I noticed this odd correlation when I start looking at the outliers. And so I, 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 I made a scattergrams with the plotting the, the amount increase or decrease of the my count. So this is um, a, a one time, uh, oh, I can remake this graph. Okay, I changed that. I changed this to 1x, 2x. So this is. Uh, the green line for all these, they're all the same scale. That means no change in mite level. This is uh, 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 tr the mite level doubled, tripled, tripled. <clears throat> and this is your starting mite count. So notice there's no correlation with the controls between the starting mite count and how much they went up any kind of trend. But when we start looking at these other ones, you notice any ones that went up quite a bit are all way over on the left-hand side. That as far as might change and the correlation between starting might count and ending might count, any that was skyrocketed up, these guys went up to six times the starting might count, but only ones that started with less than 10 mites in the initial. Same thing here, only they went uh, a couple, other than a couple. It was mainly in these just ones in the early first part. No explanation for this whatsoever. I have racked my brain trying to figure out why it is only in the very low mite starting colonies, you've got these outliers in which the mite counts shot up. Very, very strange. At, higher, at high starting mite counts, they just plummeted in for all the different treatments. And then no effect with the oxalic acid and two pads it just, they just all just went went down. No, none of those outliers going up. If one of you guys is, has a stroke of brilliance, by all means, let me know if you figure this one out. I'm 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 publishing all these graphs so you'll be able to see them. Okay, so clearly oxalic acid is a long-term treatment. So I was curious. The trial ended. Uh, that should be 42 days. Um, and then I said, well, I look at some of these that still have some mite counts at that period of time and run it longer. So I didn't do anything. I left the towels in there and went to 72 days. And you can see not much change with the, with the one towel treatment, but the, with the two towel treatment, bingo, they just keep going down. So that long-term treatment, it just keeps, it's like a, a death of a, of a slow, slow um, hammering away at those mites. So then I went back- those colonies are robbers? Uh, well, I mean, there could possibly be uh, uh, some robbers. We don't, the other thing, with robbing in Mediterranean climates, there's very little robbing that ever occurs when colonies collapse from mites. This coast, that's very common to have them robbed out immediately. But the standard um, report I see and I get from colonies that die from high levels in the late summer in California, as people say, oh man, they were full of bees two weeks ago, and then suddenly there's no bees, and here's a whole hive just full of honey and no bees. Well, if the hive's full of honey, there was no robbing taking place. And I've asked beekeepers all over the world, and universally, if you're in a Mediterranean climate, robbing does not take place at collapse of those hives. I'm talking so, about a different kind of robbing. I'm talking yeah. about your colonies robbing out other colonies, bringing back mites. Okay, so I've also looked at that, and I, I haven't published that data yet, and I did not see any correlation <clears> with, because I was tracking them on scales. So weight gain uh, uh, increased when my counts increased, and I did not see a correlation in that way either. Um, so let's see. 
Um, but that, that's what I was talking about, is my colonies robbing other colonies. Robbing doesn't take place when colonies are collapsing in, in California generally. And unless you have a nectar flow on, uh, so there's, there's fresh nectar, you don't robbing when colonies collapse. Um, I, any of you guys see robbing when colonies collapse? I see robbing before colonies collapse. Before they, before they collapse, yes, when there's a new one. I never see robbing of hives that have capped honey. They usually ignore it. Right, that's, that's exactly what, what I, I hear universally for Mediterranean climates. Okay, so, um, oh, we went back because you had that, that, that question. So I, I, I'm not sure that robbing is an issue. I have, a, I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, when you're talk, talking about these treatments, uh, particularly with the, the uh, sponges, yeah. the sponges, are you, and the, the number of days and so forth, is the treatment actually in the hive during all that time? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yep. And that's why I use the sponges so that they would hold glycerin and oxalic acid mixture so they would, so they would have enough at the end to continue to be able to apply it to the bees. And okay. Randy, can I ask another question? Yeah. Have you tried dropping the sponges in between the frames? Yeah. Like cutting them in shims and, and instead of laying it just across the top of the bars? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's a pain in the butt. And since we got almost a you know, high 90% mite, mite control laying them on there, and we're commercial beekeepers who are treating 1,500 hives, I would much rather just toss them in on the top bars than to and try to insert them between all the frames. Does that make sense? <coughs> yeah. OK. It's just sim simply a labor issue for, for me. And also, removal is much easier if they're on the top bars than if they're hanging down between the frames. OK, so now this is some data I got from 2018. I haven't published. Um, and when I was testing out different ratios of oxalic acid to glycerin and also with propylene glycol. So that's not so important what they were, but the consistency here. And what this first graph is of your mite drops. So I put sticky boards in to the hives and got baseline value for the mite drops. So the baseline is this green dot line, what it was before I put them in. And then I, I applied the treatments. And you can see that depending on on the ratio, the mite drops went up for the first uh, three days substantially and then dropped down. But they never dropped down below baseline until you get out to about a month out. And then they finally start dropping down. So you have this big mite drop for the first few days and then just continual slow additional mite drop. After that, apparently as mites are coming out of the brood, they get knocked down. So it takes a while to get um, like 40 where you start getting down here to full efficacy. Now, let me ask you a question, okay? And uh, here, Jerry, I'll let you answer this question. What if I, if I took alcohol washes of these hives? So a big mite drop the first three days, what would happen if I took an alcohol wash here? What would you expect to see? Quite low. Quite low, right? Good. There's the alcohol washes. Here's baseline. And what you they go up, <laughs> just exactly contrary to what makes common sense, right? And they stay up for quite a while, stay up above the baseline alcohol wash count. It's not until almost a month that your alcohol wash count drop below what your starting mite count was. Interesting, huh? Yes. Is there any is there any data that says that the the mites somehow are it, it, the oxalic acid interferes with their ability to sense brood to infest? Well, you took the words right out of my mouth, Jim. That's Sorry. the only explanation I can think of. So I'm glad to see another uh, smart guy uh, came up with that exact same explanatory hypothesis, uh, one that needs to be tested. But uh, I think it's a pretty uh, um, worthwhile hypothesis, um, working hypothesis to uh, to go with. So I've never heard any. Uh, with, I've heard of that with the formic acid, but I've never heard anybody uh, 
with the oxalic acid. But this that this data certainly suggests that that may, may be happening, huh? Could you repeat that? <clears throat> um, go ahead, Jim. Oh, um, the hypothesis is that the mites are confused by the oxalic acid, so they can't find brood to infest. Uh, they're, they're not, they're, their sense of smell is messed up or something. And uh, so, they, so they are roaming around in the hive. Um, and so the alcohol washers are picking up those mites roaming around in the hive because they haven't zipped down into the brood someplace. And then so they end up failing to reproduce and that's the reason for the knockdown long term. That's the hypothesis. Oh, very interesting. Yeah. Okay, so now these spent towels that have been in hives for anywhere from 45 to 77 days, when we went to pull them out, I, I hung on to the ones that were still intact and not covered with propolis and took them back to the lab and weighed them. And I knew what the starting weights were for these. And so if you take the starting weight and the ending weight, you can then calculate how much oxalic acid was left inside the towel on how much oxalic acid actually got out onto the bees. And what the results are with the uh, single, this is with the, um, oh crap, with the, uh, the, the half sponges uh, and the quarter sponges. Um, so this is, this would be a 25 grams uh, starting oxalic acid. You'll have a loss of anywhere from two and a half to about five grams right here. And with the uh, little quarter sponges, you're talking about anywhere from a gram to two grams. So these are these quarter sponges are the ones that control mites and hives over the entire course of the summer. You're talking, you know, something in the, in the range of two to four grams of oxalic acid is all it took up here. Again, we're talking uh, two and a half up to six grams, very small amounts of the oxalic um, acid unnecessary for fairly different, decent mite control. So the uh, message from this is the reason that the 50 gram treatment worked so well was not because it was 50 grams, it was because it was more surface area. So if you, because most of the oxalic acid just stayed in here. So it's, it's what's more important than the dose of oxalic acid is sponges is the surface area. So really the sponges may just be a waste of oxalic acid. So what, um, oh, let me, I'll come back. To, I'll come back to that in a minute. Now, the question is some of the trials, early trials in Georgia uh, did not get high efficacy and they were, I was wondering whether it was because of the humidity. So I had a high school student volunteer to run a trial this, uh, this summer and uh, he'll be publishing this information first. And he, found out that they get 8% efficacy with the uh, one strip uh, towels and the only one hive that was high mice did he put the two strips in and that's this one which got even much better efficacy. So if he would have used the two strip treatments, he would have had even a better than 88% efficacy for that trial. That's in high humidity in Virginia. So humidity may not be an issue. And now what I'm doing is I am testing out different matrices. I just ordered four different once I just, uh, yesterday I, I ordered um, rayon uh, felt and polyester felt and wool felt and um, a, a wood um, uh, uh, wicking mat. So I'm trying out different things to, uh, these are different kinds of industrial wipes and, and absorbents, um, many of them much cheaper than the uh, Swedish sponges. So I uh, hope to figure out something here. Hey Randy, uh, <coughs> yeah. have, so, that last slide you pretty much migrated away from the blue towels? Yes, I have. Okay. The reason is, is that some colonies chew them up really fast. Some, some don't. That didn't make much difference in my control, but they're a pain in the butt to remove afterwards. Right. So I was hoping that to have a cellulose matrix that the bees would completely remove by the end of the trial. I'm not finding that. Although David Vandersen says that the product he's trying to uh, register the bees do remove pretty well. Um, so I'm thinking now uh, I'm not stuck on cellulose anymore. You know, I might just want to go with the polyester or the 
on the acrylic and have something that's just easy to grab and pull out of the hive after the end. The uh, Swedish sponges got soft by the end of the trial are the brand I use. And it's another brand that did not get soft in a previous year's trial. So I'm just I on that. So, um, but maybe uh, uh, this, like this one right here is a very inexpensive, very thin, so you see through it, industrial um, wiping towel. So this may, may be a better one to use. So I'm wide open to, su to suggestions on this. Uh, Randy, one one question, yeah. please. Yeah. Um, th did you notice Did you notice a difference between the uh, effect C between um, single story hives and putting your um, strips on top and double story hives? Um, I, I have found that um, that putting them on a single story hive is not effective, and they need to be down in the in between the frames. That we found the same thing. So a study okay. just came out of Canada um, where they tested um, uh, them and um, they tested also a thymol in glycerin and the oxalic acid in glycerin uh, uh, worked fairly well, the thymol better. But in the, you know, in the materials and methods of a scientific paper, you're supposed to put enough information that anybody can replicate the trial. They didn't bother to say whether the hives were one story or two story. So I find myself doing this a lot, having to write to the authors of paper saying, um, you, know, you left out some really critical details, <laughs> you know, like what right. the temperature was or the weather was or what size high or how strong the colonies were or anything like that. He said, oh, they were just single story. And I said, well, was there any space above the towel? So you put the lid right down over them. Oh, we just put the lid right down over them. So that almost all the contact surface. So I was surprised they got as good an efficacy as they did. So um, yes. Yeah. So you, you want to have even these in my queen mating, What's that? Even in my queen mating nooks, I put a quarter one and I put it down under the, you know, in the frames and yes. I find it to be very uh, effective. Right. And that's, that's, that's exactly why that picture I showed a little while ago, where we put them into nooks, we did drape them over the top of a, of a frame and hang them down inside for that very yes. reason. Yes. Hey, Randy, uh, this is Phil. I was, I was wondering if on some of the mediums that you were trying, we were just tossing around this the other day on, on one of the chats. Um, I'm just looking at some other mediums, uh, you know, like burlap or cotton duck or, you know, or, uh, you know, cotton denim. Um, yeah. Any of those things? Is there anything that you would steer clear of? You think that's, that the oxalic acid reacts with that we should be worried about or? You know, I know with, with any of the cellulose, it does tend to uh, degrade it over time. Initially, I, I was hoping it would do it enough the bees would just remove the cellulose entirely, but I find they often will propyl acid in. So now I'm looking for something that, um, if they're not gonna remove it, something that will hold together so that we can remove it with one one grab rather than having to scrape it. <clears throat> so I'm wide open. Uh, as soon as you get your op as soon as you get your pesticide research authorization, by uh, by all means, try those things. How they turn out. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing I'm still waiting. To do, I think I've showed you guys this before. Is I've got this titration method. Where I can um, uh, adjust the the the, tie the liquid right here to a specific color, and then I drop a bee in, and the oxalic acid it shifts it towards the uh, yellow or orange, and then I can uh, drop in titrant uh, one drop at a time, turns back to the same color, and by the number of drops, I can tell how many micrograms of oxalic acid are on the bee's body, down down to within a few micrograms. That's extreme. That's a millionth of a gram, extremely accurate, and this takes like 15 seconds to do, and I've been just dying all summer to find time to put these various treatments and track the oxalic acid on the bees' bodies, but I just have not had the time to do it yet. So um, that's the next thing coming up to actually uh, check the different delivery methods for oxalic acid is getting on the bees' bodies. Um, one thing we do uh, out in the field, these little kitchen tongs are very handy for handling um, these uh, acid treatments, either formic or the oxalic. And we always carry a jug pre-mixed of baking soda, 10 heaping tablespoons per gallon. Uh, not, this is experimentally determined by me. You want 10 heaping tablespoons per gallon, have it on hand and uh, for both formic and oxalic, if it gets on your hands or your tools or anything else, 
this just neutralizes it within seconds. And you just, you just it's amazing. You, you you take your hive tool, you didn't realize you got oxalic acid, and you pour this over it, and the whole the hive tool bubbles like crazy, which just says it's it's neutralizing it. So uh, this 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 is very safe to carry with you. It neutralizes it very. Um, again, I have a uh, permit uh, to research this. Um, so far, technically, it's experimental only, but I think this is going to be a game changer for uh, bro management. And that's it. And thank you for your uh, donations. I know I've gotten uh, donations from uh, people in your club, and that's the only way I can do this research is uh, you guys help to pick up some of the tab. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Randy. That that was uh, fantastic as usual. Um, is there any any questions for Randy while he's still on? Yeah, I had a quick question about um, the different matrices that you use for the oxalic acid. Have you done anything similar with the uh, with formic acid? And if so, uh, what what were the results of that? No, for, I mean David Vandersen has worked um, quite well with the formic on his strips. I I've, I've done a lot of work with formic acid. We we uh, <laughs> we buy formic acid by the fifty five gallon drum, so we we uh, <laughs> we we use a lot of formic acid. Um, uh, in different ways. It's, um, it's a little more dangerous chemical to handle, but when we want to eliminate mites quickly or just uh, zero mites out in the hives quickly and aren't concerned about the queens, uh, we use the formic acid freely. Um, we actually recycle um, the old Mitoway two pads, which were a piece of uh, fiberboard uh, in a plastic jacket with 50 uh, paper punch. And that, um, uh, it takes 300 uh, uh, milliliters, uh, will absorb 300 milliliters of formic acid. So there's a, about 100 um, uh, in a, uh, a quick strip. So these hold, that's the equivalent of putting three quick strips on. And it gives a very long extended uh, formic um, a blast and really cleans up, up the hives. So we, uh, we do use that. We've also used a formic flash treatment and I've tried other kinds of applicators. Um, and I had a brilliant invention that I thought was going to patent and everything that was I just knew was just going to be wonderful with no no exposure to the to the operator at all the applicator of formic and the actual field test it did not pan out to to be very efficacious against uh, the mite so um, I'm still wide open for formic what I'm interested in is uh, time all with the uh, glycerin because of the good results out of Canada that sounds uh, very promising. Uh, thymol glycerin extended release uh, thymol. Huh. Wow. Yeah, so that, that's what I was wondering. Uh, you know, is is the extended release kind of uh, one of the big tricks that yes. you discovered here? So some of if you, got, if you have brood in the colony for any treatment, you need extended release, and that's the same thing with the apivar strips over the uh, uh, the tactic the amateur has used by the commercial beekeepers. They go back in, have to treat like three, four times in a row, once a week because it's too short term to, uh, for, because uh, there's mites in the brood. Extended release like the Apovar uh, keeps uh, leaking it out. I mean, I'd like to buy a few of those um, strips that you find on the floor of your truck. And after you're done with them, I want to use them for another session. Oh, um, <laughs> yeah, well, we uh, actually, we, uh, the only time I've used the, uh, the amateur strips Eight of our strips is just in a couple of experiments and just a few hives. So um, I, I don't have a, a truckload. I'd be happy to Too send bad. it to you. Yeah. I thought that I thought that was very clever to take one from the floor of your truck yeah. and include it in the test and yes. find that it had, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yes, it did. And I actually had to, I got contacted by a couple of clubs. Uh, people were saying, well, Randy recommend that you can use the old strips. I said, no, 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 that's not what I said at all. I've never even tried one in a, in a hive. You know, that was a, just, just a lab incubator trial that shows that it still had some efficacy. I have no idea what I would do in a hive. The last thing I need is anybody saying that I'm recommending people do anything illegal. So, uh, so I actually, uh, I thought it was a good yeah. Hey, Randy, I yeah. have a question. Uh, I got a little confused over the size of the towel. Or the, the sponge, I'm sorry. You oh, had a quarter, um, 
quarter size, do they, do they all hold the 50 milligrams of oxalic and, acid? And in the entire, they, they come seven inches by eight inches roughly, and a seven by eight, and a one-to-one -one ratio by weight of one gram of oxalic acid to one gram of glycerin, it, that those sponges held 50 milligrams. So, uh, I'm sorry, 50 grams of oxalic acid, 50 grams of glycerin. So when you cut them, and I cut them in half, so that was 25 grams, but then we cut some of those in half again, so it was only 12 and a half grams. Okay. But the, 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 the trial, the, the formal trial with the one or the two was either the 20, the half now with 25 grams of oxalic or um, for a total of 50 grams. Hey Randy, okay. um, I've got um, actually three questions. One is, uh, have you seen, uh, the, there was an EPA report says that oxalic acid was approved in 2015 by the US EPA. Uh, and uh, the other one is, um, about resistance, have you noticed any resistance to any of these uh, uh, treatments in the past? Okay. <laughs> and the first, last one was, the, there was a graph in there where you showed the, a low my count where that one grew, where the other high my count didn't. I was wondering if that could be representative of uh, resistance. Okay, <clears throat> as far as, um, well, go back to proving oxalic acid is, improve, is approved for uh, states, California is the only state that has not approved it. It got hung up because uh, Brushy Mountain went out of business. Um, I don't know what's hanging up. I, here's, the, here's the issue. I've contacted the Department of Pesticide Regulation to ask what's what the hold of is. They said, oh, well, you're not the registrant, so we technically can't t tell you <laughs> what the problem is. Um, but yeah, in the rest of the United States, it's approved, but it's only approved by the three application methods, the dribble, the vaporization, or the spray method. I'm trying to get an additional application method, the extended release method, okay? As far as resistance, the one, only study that's been done was out of Argentina, where they, uh, over a period of eight years, they had applied oxalic acid 64 times, so eight times a year for eight years. And they tested those mites, mice that had never been exposed to oxalic acid. And the ones that had been tested actually turned out to be uh, even more susceptible than the ones that had never been exposed. <laughs> so no, no, no sign of resistance. The other thing is that I doubt there will be any resistance to oxalic acid simply because that's like, like trying to develop to a, uh, um, a sledgehammer to the forehead. Um, it's, it's, they're just really powerful uh, chemicals, okay? It's, it's for the mite to develop resistance it would have to, um, like on the podia of its feet, where it's most likely exposed, these little very soft, sticky, inflatable balloons on their feet. If they toughen those up, they wouldn't be able to hold on to a bee and they'd fall off the bee. So, so the trade-off for resistance would probably be fatal to the mite for the trade-off. So I, I, doubt, I doubt that they're gonna develop resistance. If they smell with their feet, maybe that's what's uh, interfering with their sense of smell. Well, they, they actually smell with their um, uh, pedipalps, which are uh, leg-like structures in between uh, their, um, their feet and their legs, which don't have the ampodia on the end. But that, that could be. The thing is, is they, and that's where we really need to, I need to get into my titrations here. Um, the oxalic tends wants to form crystals, and I've got photomicrographs of the crystals on on the bees after oxalic vaporization. Um, and it's hard for me to imagine just how those crystals transfer to the mice. Now, with the oxalic acid and glycerin, that's it, it's different. Um, the glycerin is um, water and dissolves the oxalic acid, allows it to hydrolyze and, and free the active hydronium ions. <clears throat> and that, that might be how the mites, um, maybe by touching their pedipalps to the surface, might, might pick it up. So um, I don't know exactly. So how come there wasn't apobar in any of these studies you did tonight? Is, so you have different studies with that? 
the study was treatments that you can use while honey supers are on. Ah, and you're not, okay. Yep. Randy, Randy I, I noticed that we're seeing um, some information on um, some water in addition to the glycerin in um, the makeup of the strips. Um, I did in some early experimentation two years ago. I don't do it anymore. So you're using the 50-50-ish um, treatment. Um, 50-50, weight, weight by weight, not weight by volume. Right, weight by so weight. So the Argentines, they use a, a one to two weight to volume. What I found with that one is you can get adverse effects on the bees because the, um, the uh, gas is transferred so quickly by the, um, by the high glycerin. Right. Yeah, I, I saw a lot of your data. Wait, wait, wait. Go ahead. Bob. How about um, uh, the effect efficacy in a humid climate? You know, we have a pretty dry climate out here. East Coast has much more humidity. I, I noticed you said you had one collaborator uh, right. in the east. And so I'm, I'm having trouble finding collaborators. So the first trials were done in, uh, officially in Georgia. And the results did not look that good, but there were also issues with their trials in that in their control hives, the mite counts didn't necessarily go up. And the mite, mite counts went up and down throughout the season. It was really a strange data set. Um, and they have not repeated them. Uh, but every other trial I have seen, the Canadian trials uh, worked by feedback from commercial beekeepers using them down there. They're, they're happy with them, uh, they're, they're working. And uh, you know, I'm I'm just I'm just one for independently working on this. I'm really trying to put a uh, a fire under the feet of the, um, the USDA Agriculture Research to hop on this. They got a they got a million dollar grant to work on miticides, and um, I don't. My impression is that none of it went towards extended release. You mentioned that um, some of the hives will propolize versus chew up the towels. Does that affect the right. efficacy? Didn't seem to. But now with this, now that was the towels. I wasn't talking about sponges, I was talking about the towels. We didn't see the propolization of the towels, only around the edges. Uh, Randy. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's interesting how different Hang matrices on. On. these respond differently to. So you said you you just said that you saw a properization of the sponges, not the towels. You meant to say the reverse, or was I confused? No, propolization of the towels, but not the sponges. The only thing that they did to the sponges is they would propolize around the very edge where the towels they propolize over the top. Uh, Randy, question for you. Um, in, in terms of year-round use? Uh, are, are we saying it's safe to say um, the sponges year-round? I don't have any data for winter use. Okay. I've only done very minor preliminary trials, but I can't say a thing about winter. Um, and, you know, I doubt that it's harmless to the bees. I don't see adverse effects, but it's hard to imagine that there's not some effect on the highs. The thing is with these towels, that that June through September, there's really not much reason you'd have to do do much more than that. Um, uh, and if you know, even like a, may, you might want to do like a, a May through August, and then do a, a, a cleanup with thymol uh, in August. Um, uh, again, rotating treatments is always a good idea. Okay, thank you. Well, Randy, um, I saw, I recall some of your data was missing hop guard uh, results, and, and I, I don't recall you saying why those results are not recorded. Oh, they're recorded, but the thing is, after talking to the manufacturer, after with fact, uh, she said that I, it was permissible to have done repeated treatments that I've gone back and done two more treatments after the first one. 
and um, the efficacy would have been better. So because of that, uh, because I did not use all the options I could have due to misunderstanding of the label, I, I feel I did not give it a fair trial. So I don't feel I should, um, same reason I the, uh, the heat treatment, um, you know, I'm not, my job is not to make any product look bad, okay? I just wanna give data if it's properly used and, um, um, yeah, uh, I, I, if, if people are working legitimately on a product that could be a benefit to the beekeepers and they're not making any lies about the products, then I'm, I have no reason to disparage their, their products, if, especially if I didn't use them uh, to the best of my ability. Do you feel it wasn't a fair? Wasn't it wasn't a, a fair trial, exactly. Fair trial. Okay. Okay. And, and I'll tell you, two weeks later, I bought nine hundred dollars worth of hop garden to uh, <laughs> to use in other trials. From some of the data I saw, it looked like one of the better treatments. Yeah, I mean, it it, it has an initial mite drop, and then I've I've also uh, uh, met hats data out of Canada where they applied it um, when there was very little brood in the hive, and it worked at very high efficacy, ninety five percent efficacy. If there's if there's not much brood. Like anything else, it just needs to be an extended exposure. Any, any other questions for Randy? Well, I definitely, definitely thank you for joining. You know, you're, uh, what you do is just amazing. Um, you know, as a commercial beekeeper, I, uh, I definitely appreciate all the work you've put in and all the. Well, thank uh, you. Uh, you know, right down to mic checks, and you know, I'm now <laughs> I got my case of dawn now. And <laughs> oh yeah, I just bought some. Uh, bought a gallon of uh, dawn commercial. I haven't uh, tried that yet, but that might. Uh, yeah, I mean, the thing is, there is a never-ending list of questions, and the more research I do, the more questions are are raised. Like with the with the dawn. I need to run trials now to see how long they need to be agitated. My quit, all my agitators are designed for 60 seconds because that's what it took for alcohol. It might only be 15 seconds for the dawn. The dawn, the dawn is if you allow the bees to sit in the solution for two minutes before you agitate, almost all the mites are sitting in the bottom of the cup before you do any agitation whatsoever. That's what I've been doing. I've been doing three minutes and uh, come back, give it a little swirl. <laughs> yeah. My, 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 my guess is that little swirl may be all, all that it takes. I just need to collect hard data to, uh, to validate that. Yeah, we, we did just a little, I mean, you know, not, not the scale, but what you do, but, uh, you know, I, but we, we rewashed a bunch of them and the, we didn't see anything else come out. Yeah, it's amazing how efficacious a, what to us, we consider a non-toxic uh, chemicals that sodium lauryl sulfate, <clears throat> but apparently what it does is it immediately breaks tension floods into the trachea into the uh, uh, of the uh, of both the bees and the mites and then affects the cellular side the trachea so, so it's a um, kind of the, kind of the way it would bother your eye if you got it inside your eye but they, it must be getting into the trachea. but I was really surprised to see how dawn of, of all the different irritating substances I tried I thought the Listerine with, with, with the thymol and the eucalyptol and the wintergreen oil and the, oh, the other irritating oil, the alcohol would, would really you know, bother the mites and dawn, <laughs> it's a much harder than that. So, uh, I mean, who would have thought, you, you know, yeah, I mean, it's I'm amazing. often surprised. It's amazing. And it's very <laughs> soft on your hands. Yeah, oh, in this. <laughs> Randy, I, I have a. Me, it's uh, only adding another couple minutes to a to an inspection, and I mean that's very, very, uh, yeah, very doable for a large volume. Randy. What we do is is um, I I uh, go ahead and I, and I take my first couple of samples, and they sit, and I go home, and then I'm taking uh, subsequent samples from the hives, and so we always have a couple of cups just sitting yep. um, in a, in the rotation. So it's that, a, that's exactly what I'm doing as well. And it works, yeah, works, works just, a couple swirls, count, done. Yes. Hey, Randy, you mentioned that you had a little uh, hard time, uh, you know, refiltering it. I don't know if, uh, if my 
come up on my screen, but uh, yeah, little Coughlin's. Um, these are these are filters for camp fuel, and they've got a filter right inside of them. They're two dollars. Oh wow! From oh cool! Camp, at, at a, a camping world. store or something. Yeah. So the, and the filter is pressed in the bottom, and so uh, you can filter them out, and it's small enough to collect the mites. So they're two dollars oh, wow. filter. They're Coughlin's. All right, cool. Okay. Randy, as if you didn't have any, any enough experiments to try out, it might be interesting to snag some bees that have mites on them, uh, flip them over, and under a magnifier, dribble or drip some of the, uh, the detergent solution on them and see what happens to the mites. Uh-huh. Yeah, well, um... Well, that's you know that that's what happens in in the cups. I mean, they they, they well, right. But but it might be illuminating to tell you something about how how quickly it happens and how it happens. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what, well, what when I when I did the I did one experiment where I I agitated them for one minute with the bees. They dropped off. Then I immediately rinsed the mites off with fresh water, and then dumped them out in filter paper. And unlike as with ninety one percent alcohol, where first they died. A third of them recovered. So, but it was a very, very slow recovery from the dawn. So, so it's not like it's immediately toxic, but it's immediately very much paralyzing uh, for the mites. Well, I just wonder whether they scramble out from between those uh, those abdominal plates um, when the the stuff is applied, or they just uh, become helpless and fall out. They, uh, oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, to do it while they're on on the bee, yeah. Right. Um, now flip, they, flip the bee upside down. Put a magnifier on it. Drip uh, drops of uh, of your solution on them. That way, you're already screwed up your whole experiment. Well, it's a different experiment. No, no, you screwed it up because you want to see if they drop out, right? So if you turn oh, the bee okay. upside down, gravity's working against you. Use a mirror. No, gravity's working against you. You have to. <laughs> you're gonna have to turn them the other way. Anyway, yeah. it's easier just to dip the bee in, dip the bee in uh, detergent and watch and see if the mites drop off. And they do. They drop off very, very quickly, extremely fast in the dawn. Uh, okay. A uh, camera from underneath a, a, a flat, uh, a, a cup with a flat glass bottom. So you can, as you, as the bee is immersed in the solution, you can watch the, what happens. Oh, yeah, you don't need a camera. I can watch it with my bare eyes. We, we've watched it quite a bit with our bare eyes. It just, it's very okay. easy to watch. You, you drop the bees in and bam, they just, the mice just start dropping. <laughs> yeah, I did, did you see, I, have you seen my presentation where I did the 10 second immersions? No. Oh, I set up 10 oh. cups with different solutions and then would dip a screen cup with the bees and mites into it and for 10 seconds then to the next cup, the next cup. And then I could calculate the mite drop for every 10 seconds uh, for the various solutions. And with the dawn, by, by 30 seconds, you've got most of the mites already dropping. By 40 seconds, by the time you've done the, the four dips, you've got 80 some percent, uh, over 80 percent of the mites have just dropped off. That's very, very quick. And the dawn is a lot cheaper than alcohol and everything else. Yes, it is. <clears throat> so we're, we're, we, switched, we, we switched entirely over to dawn. We, we've used alcohol for years. We just did look back, we're very happy with the Dawn. And the, the whole trick with the Dawn is uh, making a little stand to hold the cup that has a, a magnifying mirror, 10x, six magnifying mirror, about four inches below the cup. And then you just look up and you can catch your mites very, very easily. That's a whole other presentation. All right, well, well thank you very much, Randy. Definitely okay. appreciate your time uh, again. Uh, Always, always great information. Again, really. Oh good. yes, great to see you guys. Thank uh, you, Randy. Great questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, you betcha. You guys have a great night. Wear masks. Thank so you. I see you again. <laughs> yeah. Hope to see you again soon, Randy. Thanks. Okay. Cheers. Bye night.